multi-platinum selling artist and the first woman to win five Grammy Awards in one night as a solo artist, Lauren Hill's unique blend of hip-hop, reggae, R&B, and neo-soul music established her not only as a force in the music industry, but also as an icon for a generation and beyond. Born May 26, 1975, to Mel and Valerie Hill in South Orange, New Jersey, Lauren Noel Hill was the second of two children born to the couple. Her father, Mal, was a computer programmer and management consultant, while her mother was an English teacher. Growing up... When I was a child, my father was a computer programmer and an entrepreneur. My mother was an English teacher. And uh, we kind of grew up, my brother and I, the fusion of those energies and those directions and those those focuses. Music was a huge part of the Hill household. There were so many records, so much constantly being played, Lauren said. My mother played the piano, my father sang, and we were always surrounded by music. She also stated that while growing up, the household resonated with the sounds of iconic artists, such as Curtis Mayfield, Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, and Gladys Knight. But in addition to those influential greats, she also developed a profound affection for the music of Duran Duran, Men at Work, and Carlos Santana. While a freshman at Columbia High School, Lauren met and became friends with Praz Michelle. Praz was looking for a female vocalist for a group he was starting and asked Lauren to become a member. The group was called Time, and along with Praz and Lauren was another high school friend, a young lady by the name of Marcy Harriel. Marcy and Lauren sang while Praz rapped, but after a month or so of recording music, Praz decided he needed a reggae influence on a song that they were working on, and so he called a friend that he'd played in the church band with. That friend, who he said was more like a cousin, was Wycliffe John. In his memoir titled Purpose, Wycliffe said that he had been working on solo deals on his own before Praz asked him to come join what he was doing. He was a bit hesitant at first, but Praz called him up one day saying, I'm here with those two girls I told you about in this group we call in time. We do in a track. I need you to come sing some of that reggae stuff you're so good at. Wycliffe said that Praz played it cool and didn't mention that he'd somehow got Callis Bayon, better known to the world as Ronald Bell, a founding member of one of the best-selling music bands in history, Cool in the Gang, to give them studio time. Wycliffe said about when he got to the studio and laid eyes on Lauren, the minute I saw Lauren Hill, I couldn't believe my eyes. She was in the vocal booth, and when she came through the door to say hello, I experienced that feeling when everything stops for a second. It's a moment I'll never forget. He said that he then turned to Praz and said, she's beautiful. Knowing how Wycliffe was with women, Praz replied, I know you, man. I'm friends with her brother. You can't go there. Two years after the group was formed, Marcy left the group to pursue a career on Broadway. But not long after the Marcy chapter ended, another one began between Lauren and Wycliffe. Lauren continued to pursue her acting career while still working in the group. And in 1993, she landed a role in Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, alongside Whoopi Goldberg, which she had to travel to L.A. to film. And during her stint in L.A., she and Wycliffe would talk on the phone every night. That same year, they saw signed with Rough House Records, and in 1994, their first album, Blunted on Reality, was released. The album had actually been recorded in 1992, but it wasn't released until 1994 because of label issues. It was during this in-between time that the group decided they needed a new name. According to Praz, they chose the Fugees, short for refugees, because every single living thing is a refugee, because you're seeking refugee from whatever and whenever, so we represent especially to the people from our blocks, because because we all a refugee, so we represent all that element and whatever comes to play. The album performed poorly, but according to the group, members Ronald Bell had been in charge and the production had simply failed to capture their energy and skillful blend of soul and reggae that was their style. The group switched to a different producer, Salam Remy, for their next release. They worked on a remix of Blunted on Reality, redoing the track Nappy Heads. They performed Nappy Heads on the radio, and this time, Salam did a good job of capturing their sound. Then, after their single, Boof Baff, took off, the group started getting props and offers to and for artists such as Nas, Wu-Tang Clan, and Naughty by Nature. Riding that wave, the group released the much-acclaimed album The Score in 1996, which peaked at number one on the U.S. Billboard 200 chart.
As the Fugees gained traction, so did Lauren. People recognized her for her soulful voice and engaging raps on the tracks. Her voice was confident and unmistakable as she delivered her lines with a passion that was hard to ignore. But music wasn't the only thing that Lauren delivered passionately. The affair with Wycliffe was in high gear. Theirs was a love so strong that even a little thing, like one of them getting married, couldn't stop it. While still in a relationship with Lauren, Wycliffe dated and got married to Claudinette, a pre med student in 1994. Wycliffe confirmed in his memoir that Lauren was at his wedding and that they even kept dating afterwards. They would book separate rooms when they went on tour, but eventually end up staying together in one room. But what started off as magical began to lose its charm for Lauren after Wycliffe got married. In the summer of 1996, the Fugees went on the Smoking Grooves tour, and it was there that Lauren met her second entanglement and would-be husband, Rohan Marley. Rohan was also on tour with his brother Ziggy. According to the reports, Lauren was not too keen on starting a relationship with Rowan as she couldn't let go of what she had with Wycliffe. People close to the trio at the time encouraged Lauren to give Rowan a chance and break up with Wycliffe. Unknown to them, Rowan had some pretty big secrets of his own. Lauren and Rohan began dating, but she never ended things with Wycliffe. Lauren became pregnant, and according to Praz, that was when things started to get crazy. No one knew who the father of the child was, and Lauren didn't bother to clarify. People don't know how calculating she can be. An anonymous told Rolling Stone magazine, Lauren used Rohan to pull herself out of the relationship with Clef and she happened to get pregnant. She hoped that baby was Wycliffe's because it would have forced his hand. Lauren went into labor and Wycliffe reportedly flew out to be by her side, thinking that the child was his. Still, in his memoir, Wycliffe confessed that he was disappointed when he found out that the child wasn't his. In that moment, something died between us, he said in his memoir. I was married and Lauren and I were having an affair, but she led me to believe that the baby was mine, and I couldn't forgive that. She could no longer be my muse. Our love spell was broken. Wycliffe started working on a solo album after the success of the score, and according to Proz, the group supported him creatively and emotionally. So when Lauren started working on songs for her solo album and Wycliffe showed no interest or support, she was crushed. But instead of lashing out or going into solitude, Lauren took her disappointment and hurt and challenged channeled that energy into producing her album. In that same interview with Rolling Stone, Pros explained that it became sort of a competition between the two to see who's better, who's greater. Wycliffe eventually came around and offered to help Lauren produce her album, but she was determined to not let him get credit for anything that would come out of her work, and so she turned him down. Dragonfly out in a song, yeah. You know what I mean? Lauren released her debut album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, on the 25th of August of 1998, a year after her son Zion was born. She dedicated a track to him, titled To Zion. The album was a massive success, shifting the landscape of hip-hop and R&B music and selling over 422,600 copies in its first week of release. Less than a year later, in January 1999, Lauren was nominated for 10 Grammy Awards. She won five of them because becoming the first woman ever to win that many awards in one night. The album would go on to sell over 8 million copies and be certified eight times platinum by RIAA. As of today, the Miss Education of Lauren Hill has sold over 20 million copies worldwide. Sadly, Lauren has yet to release another studio album. There have been different speculations as to why she never worked on another album, but according to her former band member and friend, Proz, he believed that the demands of stardom were too much for Lauren to handle. During that interview with Rolling Stone, a friend of Lauren was quoted as saying, she despised the manufactured international superstar magazine cover girl who wasn't able to go out of the house looking a little tattered on any given day. A simple trip to the grocery store had to have the right heels and jeans. Fashion obligations aside, much bigger trouble came shortly after Lauren's debut album hit the mainstream and started banking waves. A lawsuit was filed against her by a group 
of musicians called New Ark. Lauren had worked with the band during the production of her album. After the release of the album, to the dismay of New Ark, she took credit for the work done in writing and producing the song. So they sued for co-writing and co-production credits on the album. Lauren was furious, and she felt it was unfair for them to demand credit for work that she did. People close to her thought that the credit meant so much to Lauren because it was something that eluded her during her previous collaboration with the Fugees. Her record label, Columbia, advised her to settle, and so she did, for $5 million. Perhaps it would have been easier for Lauren to manage her professional life if her home was settled emotionally, but that wasn't the case. She soon found out that the man she thought was her husband, Rohan Marley, was married to someone else. At this point, she'd been living with him and their son Zion in a penthouse in Miami, and they had just welcomed their second child, Salah Louise, that same year in 1998. According to the reports, Rohan had gotten married during his sophomore year in college to an 18-year-old woman from New Jersey. This was in 1993, three years before he met Lauren. Lauren absorbed the information without any noticeable reaction. She continued living with him, claiming that they were married, even though there was no record of them ever tying the knot. Lauren claimed she didn't need a piece of paper to tell her that she was married. Too many things were happening at once, chipping away at her mental health, but she never caved in, never admitted that she needed help until she cracked. At this point, when she was at her lowest, a shadowy figure named Brother Anthony came into her life. Brother Anthony was a spiritual guide to Lauren, and she spent several hours at his feet ingesting pure scripture. Some of Lauren's closest friends, however, were not too fond of Lauren's new companion. Some of them believed that he was messing with her mind and that his interpretation of the Bible was twisted. In Praza's words, Brother Anthony was definitely on some other mess. It was a weird mess, man. It was some real cult mess. It didn't matter what her friends thought. Lauren found respite with Brother Anthony and his teachings, so she continued to listen to him. Her friends noted that when asked about anything, she would begin with, Brother Anthony says, during this period in July 2001, while pregnant with her third child, she unveiled new material during an MTV Unplugged special. The music consisted of folk and soul songs accompanied by a simple acoustic guitar. During rehearsal, Lauren got a tear in her throat, but wouldn't stop singing and refused to reschedule. When the album MTV Unplugged 2.0 was released, though it sold 122,000 copies in its first week and debuted at number three on the Billboard 200, critics and even her loyal fans wondered if she was okay. A review of the album at the time by Entertainment Weekly's David Brown pretty much summed up how most of Lauren's fans felt about the live show and album. It was perhaps the most bizarre follow-up in the history of Popular, he wrote. In 2003, two years later, Lauren announced a name change stating that she wanted everyone to address her as Miss Hill. Explaining the sudden change in an interview with Essence, she said, I'm Miss Hill because I know I'm a wise woman, and she wanted to be accorded the respect that she deserved. In May of 2013, Lauren was sentenced to three months of imprisonment and house arrest for tax evasion. She was found guilty of not reporting more than $2.3 million in income by intentionally failing to file tax returns for over five years. Lauren defended her negligence in her taxes by claiming that she had a family to look after and needed money. The court ordered her to pay the outstanding taxes and gave her a fine of $60,000. Since then, Lauren continued to tour, but built up a reputation for showing up hours late to her shows or simply not showing up at all. In 2016, she arrived two hours late to a Delta Live Nation concert in Atlanta. 40 minutes after she began performing, the show had to end due to a strict curfew. She tried to save the situation by having an unplanned meet and greet with her fans. Some of them booed, most were excited to see her, and a much more outspoken fan told her off to her face. As an apology, Lauren claimed that her driver got lost and there was nothing she could do about it, but the tardiness continued on every stop. In 2009, Lauren separated from Rohan Marley, although other sources claim that the couple stopped living together in 2003. When Lauren moved back to her parents' house in New Jersey, the singer welcomed her sixth child, Micah, in July 2011. Rohan sent her a congratulatory message online, subtly indicating that he was not the father. Lauren celebrated the 20th year anniversary of the release of The Miseducation of Lauren Hill in 2018. She released a new single in 2019 titled Guarding the Gates on the soundtrack of the movie Queen and Slim and was featured on the rapper Nas's 2021 album King's Disease 2. The duo also soundtrack
soundtracked the trailer for the movie Big George Foreman, which was released in April of this year. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you at the next video.